Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for our Green Steel webinar in association with NWR Communications. Today we will explore the key trends, investment opportunities and the role that low carbon iron ore, otherwise known as green steel, will play in targeting a zero carbon economy. My name is Connor Daly from Peak Asset Management and today I'm joined by Neil Goodman, Chief Operating Officer of Magnum Resources, ticker code MGU, Liam Kelly, Chief Geologist of Athena Resources, ticker code AHN, Paul Bibby, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of Acora Resources, ticker code AKO, and Tim Dobson, Chief Executive Officer of Magnetite Mines, MGT. In this webinar, we will delve into the critical topic of transitioning the steel industry towards a zero carbon economy. And for those that aren't aware, the steel industry is actually one of the largest contributors to global carbon emissions, accounting for approximately between seven to 9% of global greenhouse gas emissions. However, the emergence of a low carbon iron ore actually offers a promising path towards a more sustainable an eco-friendly future. So on that note, I'd love to introduce Neil Goodman from Magnum Mining. Neil, pleasure to have you on board. To be here, Connor. Fantastic. And, uh, and it looks like you've had a, a cracking day of trading. So I'm sure you've got a spring in your step. But before we discuss sort of today's announcement, um, I'd just sort of like to touch on a few points about the green steel industry. Um, mm -hmm. sort of more importantly, the steelmaking industry is sort of increasingly seeking ways to lower emissions uh, that has led to a greater demand for green pig iron, pig iron made with a replacement for coal, such as biochar. Now, before we talk about your project, could you talk about the market for pig iron and the underlying trends actually driving that demand? Yeah, sure. So pig iron uh, is actually the highest value raw material in, in the steel making chain. So for example, if you're, uh, if you're Rio Tinto and BHP and you're selling your DSO at hundred bucks a ton, a 60% FE, you can get, upgrade that to magnetite, sell that to blast furnaces, 65%, get about 120, 130. You go up to 68% FE, sell it to a DRI plant, 150, 160. That's the top end of iron ore. DRI will be selling for 350, $400 a ton when you convert it. And, it, and scrap steel, you can pick up for four or $500 a ton. The pig iron is in such demand from the steel makers, from the electric arc furnace. The blast furnace pig will sell for four or $500 a ton. And high purity pig iron, which is made by the high smelt process, that's selling today for $700 a ton. And that's because uh, it's, it's very high purity, very low in impurities. Uh, for example, DRI, you want to be about 3% impurities. High spot pig iron has less than 0.01% impurities. And at a steel in a steel making in the electric arc furnace, every 1% costs you $30 to treat that 1%. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to be buying iron ore at uh, five or six percent impurities. You can't afford to treat it in electric furnace. A blast furnace can. So when blast furnaces are buying pig iron and iron ore, they're looking for ultra low impurities. And that's that's why they want to buy the pig iron. It's low impurities, it dilutes the existing impurities in scrap steel. And even before decarbonization, the greenest uh, steel industry in the world is the American steel industry. And they went green, not for green carbon, but for green dollars. It's more profitable for them to make steel this way. Now it's, it's also green in decarbon. So everyone will copy the, the American way very soon by using more and more pig iron to make steel because of the impurity issues. And that's why we're in the pig iron business. Okay, fantastic. And so just for those who are viewing the, the webinar today, can you sort of explain the actual process for using you know, biochar instead of coal? And on top of that, does MGU have sort of a patented technology? I mean, how do you sort of separate yourselves from others out there in the market? As you mentioned, this has been used for quite some time. Yeah, so uh, biochar essentially is coal. If you uh, if you know coal, all coal is 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 biomass that's been heated to a high temperature, uh, driven off all the volatiles and moisture, and you're left with carbon. 
The difference is uh, coal, they do that underground for over millions of years. With biochar, you do it in a matter of minutes with a machine that's heated to 600 degrees C. So it's doing the same thing as coal making. So you're just converting plants into coal just by, by mechanical methods. And the beauty of using biochar in today's carbon constrained world is if you have a biomass that will be burnt anyway, or would be emitting methane, you can catch the carbon credits, you can use them, convert them to carbon. And when you use that carbon and emit carbon dioxide, it is called net zero because the carbon dioxide would be emitted by burning waste forestry products or emitting into uh, in a compost heap. So you can, you can capture that carbon credits and use them. So it's a net zero carbon. But essentially biochar can replace coal because biochar is coal just done, it's very younger, much younger coal, but the specification can be exactly the same as coal. So we actually, some part, sometimes we call it bio coal okay. or green coal. So that's that's why we're in the biochar business. Uh, we're fairly agnostic on the technology we use. There are several out there. Uh, we have got a partnership with Renex in Australia. We partner with them because of their know-how, they're actually doing it. And they're also using things like municipal waste. So anything with carbon in can be converted into bio coal. So they can use municipal waste such as car tires or municipal refuse, as well as biomass. Anything that is waste and uh, we can get a carbon credit for, we'll use and inject it in. And that carbon is then used to remove the oxygen from the iron ore to produce the pig iron. Okay, and in terms of the location of your project, I mean, whereabouts are you located? What sort of the local support and, and surrounding infrastructure for your project? Okay, so we're lucky. We've got, actually got a, an existing iron ore mine. It was opened up 40, 50 years ago by US Steel. It operated for a while and then shut down when the local blast furnace shut down probably in the 80s and 90s. Um, so it's it's there, it's close to uh, logistics, it's very close to the Continental Railway line, which goes down to the ports in California. So we don't have any major infrastructure costs. All we have to do is, is upgrade the trucking road that exists down to the railhead about 30 kilometers away. And then it goes onto a train, down to a ship and off to Asia. So great location logistically, uh, an existing already permitted mine. So way, way ahead of the curve on that one. Yeah, fantastic. And Neil, as I mentioned at the start of, of today's presentation, you probably have a little bit of a spring in your step. Could you provide uh, for our investors and everyone viewing sort of a, an overview of your announcement today, why it's up over 45%? You know, you've had over $6 million of stock traded today. Can you provide some clarity around that? Yeah, one of our key uh, strategic moves was to find a strategic partner to um, take the products that we're going to produce in Nevada and uh, we looked at Asia as our market rather than, rather than North America. It's a lower cost for us to go to Asia from Nevada than it is to go to, say, the east coast of the US because ships are lower cost than trains. So uh, working with Mitsubishi, uh, very, very large international, multinational trader of iron ores and coals and pig iron uh, to the world market, but they are looking for green products to sell to Asia, primarily to Japan, Korea, Taiwan. It will come to China eventually. At the moment, China is not under great pressure to go green. That will come maybe in 20, 30 years. But today, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan need green products now to decarbonize their steel industries. Fantastic. Well, that, yeah, that MOU is a massive vote of confidence for shareholders, and they're, they're clearly believing your story. Um, so next, I think, Neil, you've got a presentation that you'd like to present for our viewers today. Yeah, sure. Let me uh, share my screen and uh, I'll, I'll run you quickly through it. So, so we're talking about green steel uh, in the US. Um, so what is green steel? So it's, it's steel produced with uh, zero carbon dioxide emissions. And what we're going to do is produce green pig iron, which will then be used by the steel makers to make green steel. And as I said, pig iron is the highest value raw material in the steel making chain. So pig iron, normally more or commonly known as cast iron, it's, a, it's an intermediate product. It's not normally used uh, in industry, maybe in foundries for uh, the old engines and that, but 
thick iron is, not, is mainly uh, used by steel makers to make steel. So they take liquid pig iron, they blow oxygen in it, and they make steel in a basic oxygen furnace. That's how 90% of the Chinese make their steel. Uh, or you can melt solid pig in electric furnace. And then in the US, that's how they do it. 70% of the steel in the US is made electrically. So it's a, it's a different world in the West uh, compared to China. So why is it relevant in the US? Um, the US, because it's electric, it's the largest pig iron importer of the world, and it's growing. And Ukraine and Russia supplied 65% of the world's supply before the war. Uh, because of the war, the price of pig has jumped to $1,000 a ton. It's come down a bit, um, between $500 to $700 a ton, as they've resourced other ones, but it's in, it's in high demand. And even without the war, it was in high demand because there's uh, less and less high quality scrap available. So, as I said, high quality steel is increasingly made by scrap melting. So you need clean metallics such as pig iron. You don't want impurities. And even before the Ukraine war, this market was growing. So the 10 year average price, uh, CAF uh, Enola, which is New Orleans, Louisiana, is expected to increase uh, as this pig iron demands in the US. As I said, it's sitting today, uh, blast furnace pig iron is um, primarily from Brazil. It's selling for about $550 a ton in New Orleans. Uh, high purity pig iron is uh, sitting at uh, $700 a ton. So it is in price rises has increased already. So our mission is to profitably de decarbonize steel production by producing what we call bio PCI or bio, P bio PCI coal and green pig iron. So we're, uh, we are an Australian company, but we're located in the US. Uh, we have the Buena Vista mine in Nevada. It's fully permitted. Uh, we can produce direct ship door if we want, if the market's conditions are right, uh, and we can upgrade the ore to a DRI grade of 68% FE. We're very close to infrastructure, as I said, uh, within 30 kilometers of the main West Coast rail line down to the ports. Uh, we can add biochar units. We'll convert municipal forestry, agricultural waste from California into renewable biochar. Uh, we can produce renewable biofuels, such as biodiesel, and renewable power. So a lot of green uh, edges to this, to this party. And so the biochar and iron ore we produce will feed a high spot plant in the future to produce green pig iron. So we're looking to replace coal with uh, municipal waste or renewable biomass. So uh, we mentioned earlier, we can replace all the coal with biochar, and there's plenty of municipal waste and biomass available to produce this. So talk quickly about how do you make this bio PCI or bio coal is mm -hmm. this standard machine uh, where you feed biomass into the left left hand side, you heat it up to about 600 degrees, and out the back end there's a, what we call a bio PCI or bio PCI coal product. So technically, uh, in the machine, we start at 100 degrees, we start drying, we go all the way up to five, 600 degrees, and at the end, all we've got is, car is carbon particles. All of the gases have been driven off. And this is what this is the bio coal that we, we will be making. So as I said, pyrolysis is the technical term. Uh, we'll produce a PCI coal, 80%, 80% fixed carbon, and uh, 10 to 15% volatiles. Then we'll produce a green pig iron with this biochar. Quick overview of, of high smelt technology. It is an alternative to the blast furnace. It's a direct smelting process where the iron ore and uh, carbon are injected into a molten bath. Uh, this creates a fountain of gases that are post combusted with air at the top of the furnace, which provides the heat for the, for the uh, reactions inside the vessel. This melts all of the iron into pig iron, which is drawn off, and the all the waste materials is drawn off as a, as a liquid slag, which could actually be used uh, as a as a core product in the cement industry to reduce the carbon emissions from the cement industry. So 
with B via PCI and the high spelt will we can replace all PCI calls. We can sell this bio PCI to um, other steel industries. Uh, and 100% of carbon emissions of a high smelt plant can be reused, removed by the use of this PCI. A uh, quick look at the benefits on emissions. The high smelt using the biomass will have zero carbon emissions. You compare that to a Russian or European furnaces, they're producing about two tons of CO2 for every ton of uh, steel they make. And the pig iron quality, as I said, it's, uh, it's very high purity. And the key, the big difference is in the silicon levels. So in a blast furnace, you'll get about 0.5% silicon. Um, there is zero essentially in high smelt. And at 0.5%, that's worth uh, at least $50 a ton on a bad day. Today, it's worth about $200 a ton to a steel maker. That's a small amount, but it's a big price they're willing to pay for this lower purity. So we're looking at, uh, we've got a couple of projects going on at the moment. Uh, we're looking at Nevada, as we said, Nevada Iron. We're also looking and purchased a company called Appalachian Iron, which is looking to build a similar pig iron plant in the Eastern coast of the US using waste materials, 100% waste materials. We've looked at several sites around the US. Nevada is our most advanced, as I said. We have West Virginia. We're also talking to people in Quebec, where there is local iron ore, forestry waste, a good deep water port. The Gulf Coast of the US is excellent for barge access, steel waste, and access to CCS, which is carbon capture and sequestration. And then right in the middle of America, where all the steel mills are, we've got great rail access, a lot of steel waste, and a lot, a lot of agricultural waste. So a lot of opportunities in the future in the US. The grid itself, uh, got that up for the geos, uh, 230 uh, million tons of resources uh, measured and inferred. We've got exploration targets, which will double and triple this. So five to 750 million tons of exploration targets. Uh, we recently completed uh, an Aramag survey uh, that measured this. So lots of iron ore uh, in this area and other mines as well, uh, very closely located. So the investment highlights, we are uniquely positioned for growth in the US. The mine is fully permitted and we've got a follow-on opportunity in West Virginia. We'll start producing DSO if the market's right. We'll start doing the DRI concentrate and biochar immediately. And this is what Mitsubishi very interested in to serve the uh, Asian market. And then we'll go on to the green pig iron in future. Uh, we've got the, the expertise uh, for the high smelt. Um, all of the patents are now owned by a Chinese company, but most of the patents, they, they were written, or several of them were written by myself. So we know them. So it's a clean tech company. Uh, and we'll, we can produce net, ze net zero carbon green steel now in the US and make money, which... You know, a lot of people who are waiting for hydrogen, they can't say that. So we can make money today. We're not waiting for the hydrogen unicorn to come along. So in terms of, you know, key catalysts, milestones that investors new to the story can look out for, what are you most excited about for the remainder of this year? Well, the remainder of this year is to uh, develop their uh, relationship with Mitsubishi, start working on plans for producing uh, either DSO or DRI concentrate. Uh, probably DRI concentrate are probably the best one to go for. Start the biochar work. Um, so and we'll be doing some uh, all feasibility studies on the high spot plant as well. So a lot going on in all three areas, which we're pushing forward and look forward to uh, some more announcements soon on all three areas. Neil, thank you for your time. And once again, congratulations on the recent announcement today. It looks like you're getting a lot of investor attention and we wish you all the best. So thanks for thanks, joining Connor. us today. Cheers. William, pleasure to have you on board. Um, so before we get into the details of Athena resources and sort of what you're up to, I'd just like to sort of touch on a couple of points sort of from a macro perspective. Um, more specifically, demand uh, for increased removal of impurities and high purity concentrates before manufacturing is placing pressure on explorers and mine processing systems. 
in most cases necessitating logistically challenging and expensive upgrades, causing concerns over future demand and lagging supplies. The company's flagship bio iron ore project has the potential to mine and supply premium grade, low impurity magnetite for the production of green steel. Could you please elaborate on the importance of low impurity magnetite in the production of green steel and how your grades stack up to the rest of the market? Yeah, yeah Connor, sure. Uh, we, we, we're, we're very fortunate that, that we have a, an, an ore type, type um, which is quite unique. unique. Um, the, uh, the, the, the processed ore um, is processed at a relatively coarse grind size. Um, with inherent low impurities to start with. So we've got a bit of a head start. The um, majority of um, magnetite producers, uh, when they beneficiate the oil, they, they need to grind it down to some fairly uh, fine, so, small, small sizes um, to liberate the oil, but also to um, increase their grade. Um, the oil that we have is binodal, essentially. It's a magnetic um, um, origin. Um, and it has very low impurities contained within, within the magnetite grains within the ore. Um, so we, we've, we've got, got a head start there. Um, the, uh, one, one of the benefits of the binomial ore and, and our particular ore um, is, is that it has a relatively low cost of beneficiation. Um, uh, uh, and we're also not dealing with um, uh, problems with um, magnetic separation and, and things like that. So, um, and that, that then flows on to a uh, lower energy requirement for smelting because they're, they're not, uh, once you get to the um, steel production, uh, you, you're not dealing with impurities. Um, and then when we can get to that stage at a very high grade, um, uh, relatively simply. Um, so compared to the rest of the markets, uh, the rest of the producers that are out there, um, the, uh, the grades that we're achieving at relatively low cost and supplying into the, the green steel market, um, uh, uh, not just competitive, but um, very, very, um, very much going to be in demand. Yeah. Um, yeah, just, to, just to give you an idea of the grades, we, we, we can achieve um, 71.5 to 72 percent with um, with a finer processing. Um, we, we're we, we're able to um, produce 70.7 percent um, at um, 106 microns, um, which is very rare, um, and very few producers can um, produce that. Um, in, in, in their, their primary processing. processing. The, the theoretical, theoretical maximum is 72.34. So, um, because you have an idea, um, and, and when, when, when you quantify the impurities, uh, a 68% product um, has 680, so a ton of 68% product has 680 kilograms of iron um, and uh, just a lot of. Uh, about 28% um, of oxygen um, and 40%, uh, 40 kilograms of impurities. Now, when, when you're getting up to 71.5, you've got um, an eighth of the, number, uh, the amount of impurity, 12.5% less impurity. So, um, uh, grades is king. And uh, if you've got a product that is, um, is that low in impurities, uh, there's, there's a lot of markets out there and, and you've got a head start on the green steel um, manufacturing processes that are out there now with new technology. Oh, that's fantastic, Liam. It sounds like your grades globally are, are very competitive. Just on a quick side note, if you could maybe lean back from your microphone or maybe turn the volume down just slightly, there's a bit of an echo um, in your microphone. Uh, but otherwise... How does the company's actual exploration strategy align with the industry's decarbonisation push? Yeah. Um, our exploration strategy is, is to actually target the, 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 the high-grade, um, low-impurity material. Um, 
and as I said before, we were very fortunate that, that, that we have a binomial war type. Um, once we started focusing on, on that, um, the, the various satellite projects that we have, um, we were um, analysing them for uh, their uh, potential grade. Um, and, and therefore, uh, uh, the, the level of impurities that, it, that it could be associated with that. Um, I think that um, the, the finding of, um, of our project development and, and the, uh, the development of the industry now with um, new technologies and pressure for um, lowering carbon emissions uh, is also very fortunate for us. Um, where I, th I think it's really clear that there's a growing demand in um, low impurity um, ores um, and the, the, uh, uh, the demand is pushing up um, uh, potential lags in the supply. Our, our project is probably going to be, uh, we're, we're looking at coming uh, through the next two years to be in a position where we can push the button. Um, uh, I think we'll be in a, a very good position to be able to supply into the market. Um, um, yeah, that, I, I, I think that um, uh, as hematite being used up, um, the 62% benchmark uh, is going to become um, some, something of a um, Bygone, and we're looking now at 68 to 70 percent. So, um, yeah, uh, I'm sure that we're in a good position. Fantastic. And, and Liam, the company recently announced an exploration target estimate uh, with the potential to actually increase your current resource from 29.3 million tonnes to over potentially 1 million tonnes. Can you sort of talk about the potential there? what can investors expect from the upcoming drilling campaign and sort of its size? Yeah, um, uh, yeah, yeah we, we, we're, we're looking, looking to, to, um, to uh, convert, convert our exploration target to 100 million tonnes. tonnes. We, we see that as a, a significant figure. It's still, still not huge, but uh, one, one of the, the um, great benefits, benefits of a high-grade uh, high project, project like this is that it, the... the um, uh, availability or, or the different markets that are available for a high grade um, product, uh, 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 probably uh, more markets out there, right down to uh, blending and um, using the ore to bring lower grade ores up, up to the sea. The, the, the ore bodies that we're including in that 100 million ton um, expansion is. Uh, they, they, they have all been uh, drilled and, and tested. Um, they only require infill drilling. Um, we, we know what we've got there. Uh, we've, we've done all characterization and uh, data tube um, test work to ensure that they will meet the grade. Um, each of those, there's four oil bodies out of the eight satellite oil bodies that are uh, within our four of them are within, within 10 kilometers of the radius of the. Um, Flagship, flagship FY1 project. project. Um, so, so hopefully, hopefully uh, the, um, the, the weather will clear. Um, unfortunately, we had some serious flooding out in our, our region, region. Um, and, and it's, it's still, still drying, drying out. out. Uh, we, we were booked, uh, and, and still are booked, but, but um, we, we, we we're just, just waiting, waiting for access, access to get in the air. Uh, so, of those, those four bodies, bodies uh, it's going to be a stage, stage program. program. We, we have to move um, methodically through uh, each ore body. body. Uh, the, the process of developing an MRE um, it takes time. Um, assaying and uh, DTO and, 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 and um, uh, assessment of the or modelling of the ore body. body. Um, we, we, we've, um, we've been, been through, through the, the, the process and in burned indicated resources uh, with Athena. Um, we, we, we have, have a good team that are uh, working on that, that they, they do take time. time. So, so we're expecting over uh, the next 12 months, months that, um, that we, we will uh, completely infill. We're probably, we're probably looking um, at, at this stage. Um, uh, Bio South, South is, uh, has, has the most drilling in it, 22 holes, and we need to put in another. 
25 holes in, uh, in, in, at, at the maximum, maximum to bring that to a uh, part and nerd, part and indicated resource. And then, then follow, follow on to uh, the Whistle Jack, Jack project, project and the um, uh, Mount, Mount Area project. project. Um, steps. So Liam, before, before we continue, just apologies once again. I think we're, we're just getting a lot of echo um, and reverberation from your mic. So maybe if you just wanted to turn it down slightly or... Okay, okay. I, I, I had turned turn it down. Let me turn, turn it down, down a lot more. <laughs> how, how, how's, how's that? that? Mm. Yeah, maybe just turn down the actual speaker. Yeah, yeah I have fun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we we'll might have to just make do with that. But, um, <laughs> Moving forward, so I believe you've got a, a presentation that you'd like to present for us today. Yes, yes I, I do. do. Um, I'll just share that on my screen. screen. Um, I'll, I'll run, run a bit quickly, quickly because... Um, so. Okay, so, 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 so it's, it's a, a very small, small company. company. Um, we, we have... have um, uh, been, been working, working on, on this project for 13 years, years with the discovery. Um, we've um, completed a quite comprehensive drawing through the major, major um, magnetite um, ore bodies, um, and when we've developed the new resource, and then developed that further to the indicated resource. Um, and when we, we went, went through a period in the dog run around 2014. Uh, to 16, where we went on, uh, did a lot of R&D, and um, that's where we developed the understanding, understanding of the, the high-grade high potential, potential um, and, and, and the markets that we were presenting to today. Um, okay, so, um, we've got three, three, three members on our board. board. And, and that's the, uh, all, all, all this information can be found on our website. website. Um, the the uh, location of our project is in the midwest, midwest of um, the uh, WA, WA and Murchison district, uh, China. Um, we're um, 310 mm -hmm. kilometers from Mamalawa, if you see that technically in the middle mm -hmm. there. there. Uh, from Malawa, 100 k to the Port of the um, In the area, uh, 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 an iron, iron ore district, there are many um, iron ore um, operations and businesses uh, there. Um, the closest to the Peak, um, and uh, extinction in terms of um, commodity and, and uh, transport corridor. corridor. Uh, very, very similar, similar to ours. Uh, 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 the um, the geological grain is a very, very high grade, grade um, uh, and, and it needs to rain um, with, with intrusive um, uh, uh, layered manifold of manifold, I think. Uh, 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 um, uh, 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 um, Liam, just um, just conscious of time and just also the the audio on on this one. Maybe for investors viewing, can we just give a really brief sort of overview of the upcoming PFS and sort of the you know key catalysts and and highlights uh, for the remainder of the year um, that uh, investors should pay attention to for Athena Resources. Yeah, yeah sure. sure. Look, look, this is this is um, presentation is on our website. website. Um, these are the main, main highlights. highlights. Um, they're, um, uh, I think the most important thing here is the, 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 the liquidatics and local optics um, that, that we have, have uh, determined, um, GI engineering, and also the, 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 the our project, we're in our annual and underway with pre-feasibility study. Um, we have, through the process of our work, we've gotten really um, a professional um, assistance from laboratory and, and, and various uh, engineering to the GR engineering, so our engineering design. Um, one, 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 one of the key things about our all is the um, the, 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 the warm, 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 warm,
um, uh, overarching is probably more of a problem. So, so we can get that in flow path. path. Um, our our law has, has um, really like silica around, around. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the why they have no impurities, and it breaks in the very quick lines all the way. These, These are the grades, grades that we've, we've managed, managed to deep with various dry sizes, sizes and, and they are purity. Um, and, and we've, we've discussed, discussed that actually. Like, uh, these, 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 these are the, the, uh, the four, yeah, uh, four, four bodies, bodies that are included in our satellite building to make, make up our 100 million um, uh, uh, extended resource. Uh, um, Liam, I think... Um, Look, just in summary, just given the, the technical difficulties we're having with, with your speaker here, I think it's a bit difficult for our investors to sort of hear what you're saying. But look, we really appreciate your time today presenting. I think in summary, like you've got your granted mining licenses all completed. Uh, you've recently come out with a, a mineral resource estimate that has the ability to increase your resource from 29.3 million tonnes up to over 100 potentially. You've got a drilling campaign underway um, and also a, a pre-feasibility study, which I think is, is a pivotal point for the company as we'll sort of highlight the MPV and project economics. Um, so Liam, I really appreciate you taking the time to present today. Um, and if we have any questions on the project, I will forward them through to you and the company, but thank you for your time. No worries, thanks, thanks Connor. Connor. Thank you. And moving on to Magnetite Mines, Tim, welcome. Thanks, Connor. Can can you hear me? Okay, I'm hopefully I haven't got that same echo. Yeah, I can hear you well, Tim. I, I'm not too sure what was going on there, but I do apologise to the investors viewing the webinar today. Um, Tim, to kick off, uh, South Australia is increasingly well positioned to take a lead role in the transition uh, towards a sustainable economy with superior uh, geopolitical uh, stability, vast magnetite resources on-grid renewable energy and the development of the green hydrogen industry. Can you please elaborate on the location of your flagship project and how it stands to benefit from this push to decarbonise steel? Sure, thanks, Connor. Yeah, so South Australia um, has, is seizing the day, if you like, with the opportunity of, of a, an electrifying and decarbonising world. So last year, South Australia produced 70% of its electricity on grid from uh, intermittent renewables. And that was the highest level in the world today for intimate, uh, intermittent, I should say, renewable energies. And that was just confirmed at a conference that I attended this morning, uh, the Ostmine conference this morning by the Deputy Premier, uh, Susan Close. Um, and, the, and, the, and the state's well on the way to 100% renewables by 2030 is what the government's saying. Electronet are telling me that they'll get there by 2028, in fact. So on the back of that, the government's now pushed hard and uh, boots and all was the words from the Deputy Premier, Premier this morning into green hydrogen as well. And there are, there's, a, there's a state government uh, funded um, green hydrogen project on foot and, and, and several other private sector uh, green hydrogen projects on foot in the state. Copious magnetite, there's three big large magnetite uh, rich regions in the state, which have been known about for a long time. So here are all the ingredients now to make uh, green iron. Um, and this is where the state is pushing. So our project is 240 kilometres north northeast of Adelaide, um, and about 150 kilometres from the Spencer Gulf. Okay, fantastic. And you recently were accepted as a partner to the Heavy Industry Low Carbon Transition Cooperative Research Centre, where you'll look to sort of work alongside industry peers and you know world leading researchers to help solve iron ore and steel sector decarbonisation strategies and, and challenges. What are some of the, I guess, initiatives, you know, research and projects that you'll be looking to, to undertake alongside this partner? Yeah, so the Hilt CRC is it's much, much less of a mouthful, um, has been established for a while. It's a government funded uh, research initiative that brings together academics uh, in terms of universities, uh, brings uh, in the government into the table and the South Australian Department of Energy and Minerals are one of the of the members as well of this uh, CRC, uh, and of course the private sector in terms of industry. Um, and there are some and some heavy hitters across, and it's across all heavy industry. So it's um, for South Australia where it's based, we've got the cement industry, but it's also covering some uh, aluminum and aluminium works, but there's a big heavy emphasis on the um, iron ore 
and steel industry as well, given that the, uh, the steel industry emits seven to eight percent of the world's carbon dioxide emissions. So the, the, uh, the, the, we're about one or two years into what will be an eight to 10 year program. And there are a number of projects uh, already focused directly on the iron and steel industry, looking at from the downstream end of things like hydrogen burners uh, going into blast furnaces and then um, into, into DRI plants. Uh, there's a lot of DI production around the world at the moment, but it's all based on natural gas. So shifting that to hydrogen is a big focus. As far as magnetite mines and the other magnetite producers that are members of this CRC are concerned, there's a big focus on beneficiation of low grade ores efficiently. So lower grinding energy, lower cost, lower power consumption. Um, and also uh, what we're bringing to the table is potentially looking at uh, a bigger focus on dry magnetic separation, which has really big implications for the use of water in an arid country like Australia. That's critical, but also it uh, avoids wet tailing dams as well. Um, when you can get away with dry magnetic separation. So that's one of the other focus areas. So it's a really important CRC. It's funded by government and it brings together uh, all of the key players that will be needed to introduce new innovation and technology. Yeah, fantastic, Tim. And you also recently signed a landmark community uh, memorandum of understanding and MOU for the Razorback project. Could you please sort of elaborate on this agreement and explain why this is an important milestone for the project? Yeah, exactly. So this is a unique, um, a unique MOU. We're not aware of other mining companies and, and aspirant developers that that have signed um, commitments with local government authorities, such as what we've done with the Peterborough District Council. It was a, a long time in the making. The council is uh, right behind it, and we actually signed it last Friday and announced it to the market um, in a ceremony up in Peterborough in the council chambers, uh, followed by a community event. Now, why are we going to this level of effort early on? couple of reasons. One, we, uh, as the culture of the business that we want to build in magnetite mines is, is very heavily focused in sustainability leadership um, and, of course, stakeholder, uh, um, stakeholder engagement uh, and bringing stakeholders along for the ride is a big part of the ESG uh, components. The, it's the S, the social part in ESG. Um, but secondly, what we are developing uh, in South Australia is not a small project. It's a massive project that will only get bigger over decades. We're actually opening up an entire new iron ore province. So our impact on our local community will be profound over time. And we want to make sure that it's profoundly good instead of uh, otherwise. So that, that's why this is such an important early stage foundational piece of work where we will engage continuously with the local community. And we've committed that in writing. Uh, and signed up with the with the with the local government authority there. Okay, fantastic, Tim. And you recently completed a number of optimization studies to actually sort of support the emerging South Australian green iron industry. Can you sort of please elaborate on your findings and how these will assist in decarbonizing the Razorback project? Sure. So the, the key reason that we put on the optimization studies in September last year and have just completed in the last month or so. Was, was primarily to look at a larger scale startup project. So the company was previously uh, contemplating a smaller scale project, a more modest capital investment um, to get up and running. But the market feedback was that the scale that was being looked at was really irrelevant in the, in the global scale of, of what's needed to decarbonize the, the green iron and green steel sector and that a bigger uh, project was needed. So we looked at uh, a range of different capacities and have settled on 5 million tonnes per annum output as our logical startup stage. It's still fairly small, but it's one that we can get our hands around, prove ourselves as a producer, um, establish a brand for our product, and then use our cash flows to support continued expansion into a much larger project, uh, um, logically to 10 million tonnes um, uh, after that as a second stage of expansion. And, and then beyond that, our, our resource is massive. We have 6 billion tonnes of, of iron ore and resource. We have 1.6 billion tonnes already in ore reserves. So you can, you can see the sort of scale that we're looking at. So the optimization studies did settle on those numbers, but also we've identified um, Iron Peak as our highest grade deposit within our project area. Um, and it's pushed about our focus to prioritizing that ore for the startup of our project. It's a big project, enhanced infrastructure is very, infrastructure needs, power, water, rail, port are all uh, big components of this project. So the optimization study is also focused on all of those areas to making sure we can get the lowest uh, possible cost in terms of capital and operating and, and the best efficiency for the project as, to we, as we commit to, to such a big project. 
Yeah, fantastic, Tim. And I believe you've got a, a presentation that you'd like to, to run through with the investors listening today. Sure. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. So um, I've got a, about 15 slides here to get to. I'm going to get through at a fair clip, though. So the first few slides are really just talking about the, the, the reason that these magnetite projects uh, in South Australia are suddenly becoming viable after having been known about for many decades, in fact. Um, uh, so I think most of the watchers here will be intrigued about why what's happening in the steel industry. Steel industry is growing rapidly uh, and has has doubled in scale every 20 years for the, since 1950. You can see on the left hand scale here where China's had a big influence on that. It's going to continue to grow. Forecasts vary depending on what people's views of emerging economies such as India, etc., are and their use of steel going forward. On the right hand side here, there's actually a contribution to that two billion ton uh, steel industry per annum. Um, that the, the the energy transition is going to add another 100 tonne per annum of steel consumption there just to build all of the renewable energy facilities as well. So that's where the demand uh, for steel is going to continue. However, it's a very dirty industry, as I mentioned before, 7 to 8% of, of carbon emissions around the world are, are produced by the steel industry. That has to come down to 02 to meet the, uh, the Paris Agreement and then subsequent COP targets. And in COP 26 and 27, there were very strong binding commitments by member countries to decarbonize all of their heavy industry and of course their steel industry. So now um, one of the one of the big breakthrough agendas of COP is now based uh, solely on steel decarbonization. On the right hand side here, you can see the net result of that is that the D, that the carbon taxes will be applied by governments uh, and things like the European Union are going to um, uh, force all of the steel makers and have forced them to make commitments to decarbonize. And you can see right down this list, all of the big steel makers around the world have actually made those commitments and now trying to figure out how they're going to going to meet them. Um, so the, the, the shift in technology, as most people be aware, away from the very traditional blast furnace, uh, basic oxygen furnace route to steel, which is convenient, cheap, uses and uses lots of coke and coal, produces a very heavy carbon footprint, as you can see on the right hand side. We see a transitional phase now commenced where blast furnace uh, producers are now trying to reduce their carbon footprint. As we heard in some of the early, earlier uh, discussion, um, that's being achieved by adding in higher grades of iron ore, reducing impurities into the feeds. That brings down the carbon footprint, but only, only partially. Uh, the product that we'll be able to produce from our Razorback project will feed into that transitional period. But the end game is to come up with a very, very low carbon footprint, as you can see on the bottom right here. And that uh, the only known technology, um, uh, the technologies apart from using scrap uh, at the moment are using direct reduced iron processes. At the moment, um, all the DRI around the world, which are usually in natural gas rich areas, uh, are using natural gas, combination of carbon and hydrogen uh, to do that reduction, which uh, replaces coal. Um, now in the end game for green uh, steel is to use green hydrogen produced from renewable energy, then you get your footprint down to a very, very low level and, and meet the commitments. That's that's a transition that we can see taking place over 25 years. China will be the laggard. They've got the biggest job to do, um, being the biggest steel producer in the world by a long way. Um, and uh, they'll, they'll probably take to 2060 to get to this point. So DRI is one thing, but it, uh, as we heard earlier, it needs a very high grade of iron ore to, to uh, to work, particularly when you get to the uh, EAF. So DRI takes place, uh, direct reduced iron takes place in the solid phase. It's not yet melted. Um, it rips the oxygen off the iron ore, which is an iron oxide and just leaves iron behind. And then that goes into a melting furnace called electric arc furnace. So the right, the, the grades that are acceptable for DR technologies as we know it today are in the top left-hand corner of this left-hand chart. A very small window here in terms of iron content up over 67%. Um, and that means very low impurities, which is the x-axis on this chart. The other things you can see on this chart are the, um, uh, the big iron, um, iron ore deposits around the world and where they fit in terms of uh, grade and impurities. Um, in Australia, we have a number of magnetite projects already um, getting up to that 66 to 67% uh, concentrate grades, um, but with um, varying amounts of impurities there. And as you can see, our project up here just comes in uh, up at a 68.5% iron and, and around uh, just under 4% impurities there in terms of silica and alumina, which are the two key ones. So this is a very small um, amount of production that's available in the world today. And this is the conundrum that this uh, transition faces. 
we, on the right hand side, you can hit, see here Bloomberg's predicting that the amount of DR grade pallets to feed um, DRI facilities that are now being committed to by the world steelmakers has to go up tenfold from 100 million tonnes today per annum to 1,000 million tonnes per annum by 2050. A formidable task given that um, there's not much of this high grade material around. Um, this next chart just looks at uh, some of the premiums that are being applied now to DR pallets. You can see on the on the left hand side. And in fact, uh, as we heard before, we the 62% index, is, which has been the basis for many years to measure all other irons uh, against, is, is now shifting. Uh, fast markets, for example, have just created a brand new index at 67.5%. Uh, pallet feed index, you can see that here on the right hand side. And what we've done there is just compare the specification that we can produce from our magnetite project in South Australia, very, very similar to this, to this spec. So this is a brand new index, which is now being tracked um, and to, we'll measure the new supply and demand for these DR pallets as that market grows over the coming, say, five to 15 years. So it's a really big shift, or once-off shift in the global steel industry, and, and it's quite profound in its impacts to the global trade around um, iron products and, and steel. Um, this quickly just shows where our project sits on a value in use. So what value in use uh, um, means on a, on a global cost curve. We're looking at production volumes on the x-axis and uh, the cost of production on the y-axis on a value in use basis. So this is against the 62% index and for every iron ore um, uh, uh, production component of this cost curve, the premium or discount that that, that product will um, achieve against the 62 index is applied and it brings everything back to a common base against the 62 index. What that means is high grade iron ores move to the left because they get bigger premiums and low grade iron ores that say, for example, FMG are producing below 60% um, out of the Pilbara today move to the right because they're getting heavier discounts as this shift occurs. Um, but just to make the point that our project with the premiums that, uh, that can be applied today and are expected to increase uh, keeps our project in the lowest cost quartile, even though we have to do the process, the extra step of processing that on site. South Australia, as I mentioned in the Q&A session, Connor is, um, is extremely, uh, I guess, lucky that it has massive wind and, and solar resources. It's a tier one geopolitically stable location with a very strong and solid mining history and regulatory uh, environment. Um, and now it's committed boots and all to a hyd green hydrogen sector as well. And it's attracting the attention of our regional steel makers, in particular, Japan and Korea. Japan and Korea have a very low ability to produce a massive amounts of renewable energy. Um, and therefore a very high cost of hydrogen. So they don't, they don't want to produce their own hydrogen. They want to use somebody else's hydrogen. So South Australia, Western Australia, Canada and Brazil are competing for the attention of these steel makers as they're looking outside of their boundaries to make a reduced iron and a green iron product offshore and then import it back home and melt it in their electric arc furnaces. That's a, that's a big shift from importing coal and um, iron ore for blast furnaces. So this is, this is where SA has these advantages. On the right-hand side, we just recently commissioned BDO to look at the benefits of our project and what it will bring to the region uh, and to the state and to the Australian economy. Um, and uh, I'm not gonna go through the numbers one by one, but you can see some considerably um, uh, material economic impacts to the state and, uh, to the, and to the federal economy, as well as um, a good employer as well in terms of full-time equivalent jobs you can see at the bottom there. Yeah, no, that's fantastic, Tim. And look, you've provided a, a really good sort of macro overview of the sector and more specifically highlighted um, you know your location of your project and sort of the government tailwinds looking to support and you'll be you know in a fantastic position to capitalize just in a conscious of time could you provide sort of a you know an overview of the key catalysts for the remainder of this year and maybe sum up in two or three sentences why someone should invest in the company sure um, this is what it looks like by the way where we are um... A very, very strong protruding outcropping magnetite project. So to answer your question directly, during the course of this year, we'll continue the major de-risking mainly of our infrastructure requirements. We're well on, on track with that. If, you, if anyone's interested in looking at our company, you'll see a series of announcements over the last few months. We will move to a formal partnering process. This project's going to need a large capital investment and we will certainly be looking to partner with some of the off-takers uh, and um, with, with big balance sheets that we've been, been talking about. So by the end of this year, we can expect to be in a partnering process, moving towards the completion of a DFS, getting our approvals uh, out of the way, 
um, and completing native title agreements and land access agreements. So very exciting time. We've got a lot of work because it is such a big complex project, um, but it is actually part of opening up a whole new iron ore province in South Australia um, that enables this green iron sector to evolve. Great. Thanks, Tim, and really appreciate you taking the time to present today. Yep, no problem at all. And Paul, last but certainly not least, from Accor Resources, welcome. Thank you, Connor. Thank you very much. Fantastic to have you here. Um, the company has clearly articulated uh, what I believe is a very um, smart approach where you've got a two-step approach in order to take advantage of the green steel uh, by first focusing on the DSO opportunity. For investors listening today, can you sort of outline this approach and why you went to go down that path? Um, thank you, Connor. Yes, look, um, the ultimate uh, prize for us is the high-grade concentrate low impurities to feed the green steel, which is the theme of today's webinar. Uh, to get there requires you know, considerable capital, as our colleagues today have uh, discussed. What we have at Becky Soper is something that's quite unique in that we've got our cropping iron ore and a high grade weathered zone. And uh, that can produce um, above benchmark grade, 62% lump and fines iron ore. Today, we put out an announcement uh, from the bulk sample testing that we did late last year. And the average grade for the at surface um, lump DSO, direct ship ore, so all you need to do is uh, mine that, crush it, screen it, and ship it to the customer, was 67.5% and the fines at 64.5%. So they will both achieve a premium above benchmark grade because of the additional iron units and also should not uh, incur penalties because the impurities, silica, aluminum, and phosphorus are all well and truly within spec. So the idea is to start with a low capital uh, operating cost scenario uh, with the DSO, six, 10 years, and then use the cash flow from that opportunity to improve the process, enhance the process for extra grinding and magnetic separation to produce a high grade concentrate for green steel. Fantastic. And what's sort of the size of your resource and, and scope to potentially expand? Yeah, look, um, the scope to expand is, is considerable. Um, the strike at Becky Soper is six kilometers long. It's a very intense magnetic anomaly. We've only drilled a third of it, um, some in the north, the center and the south. Uh, and that has delivered a 200 million tonne resource already from shallow drilling. Uh, we know in the north from our deepest hole, which is 300 metres, that the iron uh, mineralisation is some 70 metres wide and is continuing well beyond 300 metres, so there's considerable potential. But as I said, 200 million tonnes, drilling only 30% of the six kilometre strike, you know, we can see that becoming you know, closer to a billion tonne uh, resource with additional drilling. Okay, there's a considerable scope for uh, improvement there on the project. So that's very promising. In 2022, Paul, you uh, recently completed a scoping study. It confirmed a viable pathway to production with robust uh, project economics. Could you take our viewers sort of through the, the project economics and sort of your plans to secure funding requirements moving forward? As you mentioned, this is sort of a, a big question mark overhanging a lot of players in the sector. Yeah, yeah. look, it's, it's the same for everyone in the junior space. Um, we conducted a scoping study using the engineers Wardell Armstrong, international reputation. They've worked on a number of iron ore projects in Europe and Africa um, over many years. Um, we aren't able to you know, comment on the capital costs and the operating costs, unfortunately, because our resource is only in the inferred status, which is why we did all the extra drilling last year and we'll be announcing a upgraded um, resource in the indicated or measured category, hopefully by the end of May. The scoping study looked at the requirements from you know, mining and processing, um, transport logistics, port, and all of those things and basically showed no roadblocks, no showstoppers at all, okay? Um, and then on the community side and the environmental side has given us the, um, the framework to do further work so that we can uh, understand better the community and social um, requirements to um, develop the project going forward. So a very encouraging study. Um, once we update the mineral resource based on the DSO drilling of last year, we will 
re-look at that scoping study and update it. That should be finished by the end of July of this year. And all being well, we'll go straight into a PFS uh, based on that knowledge. Yeah, fantastic, Paul. And the project, your company's flagship project is located in Madagascar. Now, for yes. investors that aren't familiar with sort of the political landscape, the support in the region, could you just provide some colour on, on your project and, you know, the support and the infrastructure surrounding it? Certainly. Look, the, the slides will uh, talk to that as well. Um, our project's in south central Madagascar. It's a very uh, isolated remote area. Uh, the nearest village is uh, 25 kilometres away, and that takes an hour to drive because of the, uh, you know, there's just a total lack of roads there. Um, the Madagascan government has been doing a lot of work in recent years. The mining code's actually been sort of in suspension as they've been updating it. And the updated uh, improved mining code is currently with the Madagascan parliament. Um, that's been enhanced with contributions from mining companies like ourselves. Uh, other mining companies in the country, Rio Tinto, Sumitomo, Koreans, um, and also with the World Bank. And uh, that's expected to pass the parliament in May and then you know, through the second house of parliament by the end of June. And that will give all companies in exploration and mining in Madagascar very clear and a confident pathway forward. Um, the two changes of note is that the uh, royalty has increased from 2% to 5%. Um, 2% was, I would say, uh, somewhat low in world um, comparisons. 5% is still competitive. And if you do any transformation, that gets reduced to four. And transformation is considered to be upgrading the resource in the ground to a saleable product. So we should look at a 4% royalty, which I think um, you know, those in the industry would appreciate is, um, is a sensible and um, competitive royalty. Uh, and the other is a social fund where, based on your capital for your project, you contribute um, potentially up to 3% for a social and community fund to uh, progress development and the lifestyles of people in, the, in those communities. So um, that should all be passed by the end of June. And um, as a result, the, the jurisdiction will be clear and people will have you know, confidence about how to progress their projects. Yeah, fantastic. And the company recently announced a share placement and entitlement offer. How much are you looking to raise? What are the funds going to be used for? Yeah. So look, it's in two parts, as you said, uh, a placement, then a, uh, a, a, um, a raising with our shareholders, a rights issue. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking to raise around $3 million. Uh, that will fund the activities, which is a pretty intense program over the next 15 months. And uh, the, uh, the program starts with um, the mineral resource estimate, end of May, uh, June, the scoping study going into the pre-feasibility study. That's a, a $1 million exercise. But also, uh, and very importantly, we're going to do an airborne magnetic survey at the tenements nearby to Becky Sopa, where there's a, a magnetic anomaly. There are rock chip samples that are very high quality, and that potentially could add you know, 10 to 20 kilometres of strike in that region to um, look potentially for further iron ore and increase the resource quite significantly. So there's there's a lot of work to be done within that uh, $3 million that we're looking to raise. Fantastic. And Paul, I believe you've got a presentation that you'd like to share with us today. I have. And if uh, Tony can uh, push us through the slides, that'd be a great help. All right, so um, as we've touched on, Acora Resources is iron ore in Madagascar. And what we're looking to do is have a DSO startup and use the cash flow from that to fund the uh, green steel future. This is a look at the corporate structure of Acora. We only have 77 million shares uh, on issue. Uh, our share price last Friday was 15, today it's 16. Um, the top 20 shareholders own 51% of the company, so it's very tightly held. Um, those shareholders come from Canada, uh, North America, and the UK, and then a number of us here in Australia, including the board of the company. Uh, the board is a good board, Mike Sturzaker, uh, myself, and John Madden, who founded the company, uh, an excellent uh, accountant and uh, CFO and company secretary. The map of Madagascar here, the, uh, the green dots are well-progressed exploration projects. So you can see a large number of projects, um, very many different commodities, chrome, graphite, uh, mineral sands, 
and our project, Becky Soper, iron ore in the south centre of Madagascar. What is quite attractive and, and really has determined why we're focused on this project and not our other projects is the high grade outcropping, which you can see in that left hand photo. Those outcropping lumps of metal um, are grading 66, 67% iron. And all they need to be done is to dig those up, crush and screen, and you have a lump product uh, for the market. The image on the right hand side is a trench that's about three meters deep. And what you can see in that trench is lump and fines iron ore and the nearby drill hole graded 66% iron. And from today's announcement, what we've shown is when you dig that up, um, screen it and produce a lump and fines product, you're seeing a lump product of 67% and a fines product at 64. So very encouraging for the stage development of Becky Soper to deliver high grade DSO, um, low operating costs, good margin, and use that cash flow then to develop a process for producing a premium grade plus 68% iron concentrate for green steel. So what we're seeing um, after the two years of work that we've put in at Becky Sopa is that with part of a potentially a very significant iron ore uh, district. So the work at Becky Sopa, uh, we're continuing the same plan at Satrakala where we see a 10 kilometer strike and um, you know, quite a lot of work. The maiden resource we spoke to, uh, just under 200 million tonnes. The Davis tube recovery of 38% is uh, relatively high due to the high average grade of around 35% um, through the whole weathered zone and the fresh rock. And that delivers a concentrate grade of just under 68%. The Becky Soper geological features are the coarse mineralisation, which enables the mineralogy to be um, upgraded uh, very readily at coarse sizes uh, with low impurities. So this, um, again, reinforces the geological advantage. This is one of the drill pads. You can see our cropping iron ore there at surface, the lump and finds in the wall there. Um, we screened that. And as today's announcement said, a lump product there, which is from six to 32 millimetres, the best feed for a brass furnace at 67%. You know, that potentially delivers a $40 US dollar premium above the benchmark price. And the finds there at 64 or so, um, both excellent products and will enable us then to move into the green steel, which is what today's webinar is about. So the next slides are on green steel, I believe. Um, I think I've really touched on these investment opportunities in the world so far. Um, a significant resource at Becky Soper, estimated to be over a billion tonnes. We've spoken about the geological advantage. Green steel, um, as our colleagues today have spoken about, it's not just about having a high grade iron concentrate better than 68%, you need very low impurities. And also Madagascar has a high solar intensity. So we'll be having a site powered by solar, uh, which is an, an additional advantage. Geologically, we're close to the Indian market, which is rapidly growing, but also importantly, we're close to the Middle East, which is already producing green DRI pallets using the abundance of natural gas they have um, there. I think we've covered this quite well. I think uh, Tim and others have done that. Um, today, seven or eight percent emissions, predominantly ballast furnace from coking coal, um, good grades of iron ore, 56 to say 65 percent lump and fines, impurity levels of six to maybe even more than eight percent silica and alumina, delivering two tons of CO2 per ton of steel. To get to net zero, we've got to move to the electric arc furnaces or similar technologies um, powered by renewables and fed using direct reduced iron, either from natural gas or hydrogen. The grade has to be better than 67%, impurity levels less than three and a half, because we haven't got the reductant, the coking coal, which reduces those, uh, the oxygen out of those impurities, but also puts them into the slag. And ideally the impurities need to be less than 2%. So a core is quite well placed for the concentrate that we produce for green steel. This is an example of um, the typical material we have. We've got a lot of material that's greater than 25%. Um, we've done over 3,800 Davis tube tests. More than half of them were on material greater than 25% iron. And the image on the left-hand side of your screen is a 40% iron uh, drill core, 28 meters below surface, so close to surface. That upgrades to 70% iron concentrate at 75 microns, so a relatively coarse sizing and very low impurity levels, 0.5 plus 0.7, 1.2% uh, impurities, perfect match for the green steel requirements. 
Um, and as a result, you know, Acora has the quality, uh, we have the location, and the project should come on time when there's going to be a deficiency in supply of uh, this high-grade material for producing green steel. I think um, others have touched on this, but this is from Wood Mackenzie. What they're saying, a five-fold increase in demand for high-grade concentrate with low impurities by 2050. So the green bars there going from 150 to nearly 800 million tonnes by 2050, but they don't see where the supply is coming from. And Acora's project isn't in this data at this moment. So there's a big uh, shortfall and our uh, project should be available at the right time um, and potentially see very good prices for high grade concentrate. Um, the transition to green steel is gaining momentum. Here's a few uh, articles that I've uh, collected over time. You know, decarbonizing in the steel industry, March 20. The Japanese steel is looking to spend $700 million at one of their projects to convert to green steel. Germany um, and other parts of Europe are looking to produce green steel. Germany is an interesting case because they have a large manufacturing industry. They want to keep that in their country. They need high quality steel from renewable and green sources. So they're looking to upgrade their steel industry um, and so on and so on. So there's, there's plenty of momentum already gaining, um, which is going to require the high quality feeds that uh, the magnetite projects are able to deliver the high grade iron ore concentrate. The geographical advantage for uh, Acora is that Madagascar off the coast of Africa is close to India, um, which is looking to double the size of its steel production by 2030 from 130 million tonnes to 250 or 60 million tonnes, quite a significant amount. That won't be all conventional blast furnace technology, some of it will be. A, a proportion of that will be electric arc furnaces and the like requiring uh, high grade concentrates with low impurities. We're also close to the Middle East, which is already producing DRI pellets, and we'll be looking for more high-grade concentrates uh, in the future for their steel industries, but also as feed for other steel industries around the world. I guess this is a slide for all of us that are, are in um, the magnetite uh, field. Larry Fink from BlackRock uh, recently said that the next thousand unicorns, companies that have over a billion dollars in market cap, won't be search engines or media, media companies. They'll be companies that are in the green field and in particular, green steel. So thank you very much for your time, everybody. Connor. Thanks very much, Paul. And I guess that brings us to a conclusion of today's webinar. Thank you to all our panelists and viewers for joining us today in association with NWR Communications. I hope uh, for all of you watching that we've provided some clarity around the vital role of green steel um, and the role that it'll actually play in transitioning to a zero carbon economy and more specifically some of the investment opportunities here on the ASX that are emerging in the space. Until next time, have a nice evening and take care. Thank you, Connor. Thank you, Connor.